Welcome to the Lecture on the Heart. My name is Carlos Andres Orezquian. I am the author and narrator of this lecture. Let's begin. This lecture is divided into three parts, each of which represents an objective for the lecture. First, we will discuss what is the mediastinum and the structures found there. Second, we will present the coronary circulation. Finally, I will discuss the heart, in particular, the structure and its functions. Each will be presented in a separate video. In the image, we see the torso of an individual in the anatomical position with a thoracic cage superimposed. If the thoracic cage is dissected away, this is what we see. The sternum and rib cage were cut and reflected upwards. The right lung with its surrounding parietal pleura is clearly visible, as is the left lung and its parietal pleura. The mediastinum is a central part of the thoracic cavity now outlined in the image. In the upper part of the mediastinum, in adults, a fatty, light structure is evident, the remnant of the thymus. Inferior to it, there is a membranous layer, and this represents the pericardium, the lining of the heart, and the heart is contained within this area. For orientation purposes, the mediastinum is further subdivided. Here, we see a thorax in which the ribs and the sternum have not yet been removed. The manubrium is clearly evident, as are the body and the siphoid process of the sternum. Anatomists generally subdivide the mediastinum by drawing an imaginary line at the sternal angle of Louis and between the body and siphoid of the sternum. These imaginary lines are used to subdivide the mediastinum into a superior and an inferior mediastinum. To give a more clear picture of how the mediastinum is divided and discussed, I now present this drawing of a sagittal section of the thorax. The two imaginary lines are drawn in. The upper line, at the angle of Louis, projects posteriorly to the intervertebral space between vertebra T4 and T5. This line divides the mediastinum into a superior and an inferior mediastinum. The inferior division is further subdivided into an anterior, middle, and posterior compartments. Technically speaking, T3 and T4 make up the bony back of the superior mediastinum, but vertebrates T1 through T4 are commonly referred to as the posterior wall of the superior mediastinum. The image we described previously is now reproduced and presented at the lower left-hand margin. Let's look now at the mediastinum from its side with the ribs and left lung removed so that we can peek inside the mediastinum proper. Focusing on the mediastinum alone, we add the two imaginary lines we described previously, the one at the sternal angle superiorly and the other at the juncture of the body in siphoid process of the sternum. We can now list the structures that are found in the superior mediastinum, and this list is extensive. I'm not going to read the list to you, but it's not an empty exercise to stop the film and think through this list and try to place them in order from anterior to posterior. We will look next at the inferior mediastinum, as you can imagine, the number of structures found there is even greater than in the superior mediastinum. Consequently, anatomists further subdivided the inferior mediastinum into an anterior, middle, 
and posterior mediastinum. Clearly, when we focus our attention on the heart, we'll look more closely at the middle mediastinum. The overwhelming number of structures listed in the previous image, however, should not surprise you. There are 11 physiological systems in our bodies, and it is possible to argue that all 11 are represented in some fashion in the mediastinum. Of course, the circulatory system is the one we tend to think most of when we think of the mediastinum, and it is the system we will focus on with the rest of the lecture. Before continuing with the anatomy of the heart, I will describe some incredible facts that are now commonplace, but at one time they seem like science fiction to most clinicians. On the left panel is an image of the longest surviving artificial heart transplant patient in the UK, Peter Houghton. He died at age 68 in 2007, having survived over seven years with a Jarvik 2000 artificial heart. On the right is Seth Wharton, longest living survivor of an artificial double heart replacement over 31 years. He is still alive today. The heart also has been an organ that engendered numerous quotes throughout history. Here's my favorite one from Pascal. The heart has its reasons which reasons know nothing of. Yes, the heart is nothing more than a mechanical device, a pump, but it certainly gained much significance in history when the human race recognized that life itself is not possible without this organ. However, there's still much more that we need to know about the heart. Before COVID, heart disease was the number one killer in modern societies. Here's an astonishing fact. One in five males and females has some form of cardiovascular disease. Since 1900, cardiovascular disease has been the number one killer in the U.S. every year except 1918, the year the Spanish flu pandemic. Well, what about these past two years vis-a-vis -vis COVID? Here are the numbers. Heart disease is still the number one killer in our society. And when you look at the numbers for the various types of heart disease, the numbers are staggering. It is estimated that over 60 million Americans have one or more types of cardiovascular disease. Before discussing the anatomy of the heart, let me briefly mention some historical facts. I present here a short timeline between Hippocrates, the father of medicine, and the Roman Empire of the first century AD. In the times of Hippocrates, only some minor surgeries were possible. By the time of the Romans, Cornelius Celsus published a textbook describing goiter removal, hernias, stones in the bladder, and how to perform a limb amputation. What had transpired during this time? First, Erisistratus and Hierophilus had dissected the human heart, recognized its four chambers, and realized that the heart was a mechanical device, a pump. Its purpose was to pump blood to other parts of the body. More importantly, some unknown individual, history does not record who it was, Realize that if one ligated blood vessels, patients would not bleed to death. It was this simple observation which led to the beginning of surgical procedures thousands of years ago. In a little bit of anatomy history, let me tell you what the Greeks knew and thought about the heart circa 280 BCE. Aristotle, for example, a century before made the claim that the heart was the most important of all organs and the seat of all intelligence. These ideas were based on observations of chick development in the egg. It made Aristotle realize that the heart was the source of blood. 
depends, since blood was thought to carry heat, the heart must be the source of heat. Based on animal studies, Greeks knew that the heart had four main vessels, consisting of arteries and veins. But they thought the heart had only two sides. The right side was believed to hold blood, but without pumping it. Intelligence, as Aristotle envisioned, resided in the left side of the heart. Aristotle even tried to prove that the left side of the heart did not contain blood by demonstrating that poured water into the aorta would not enter the heart. Valves were present at the root of great vessels. It is speculated that the rationale for these ideas was that pumps had not been invented yet. Archimedes did not invent the water screw until nearly a hundred years later. Ten years later, Herophilus and Erisistratus, performing dissections on human hearts, realized that the function of the heart is to pump blood. They described the four chambers of the heart, the valves separating the atria from the ventricles, the tricuspid on the right side of the heart, the bicuspid or mitral valve, on the left and recognize that the valves are anchored to the heart by cords. Importantly, they figured out that the heart receives blood from the veins and in turn pumps it out via the arteries. It is this distinct function of veins and arteries that gives rise to the naming of these structures. Veins bring blood to the heart, arteries carry blood away from the heart. However, it was not until the Renaissance that Harvey figured out that blood leaves the heart to be oxygenated by the lungs. Then it is returned back to the heart and pumped to the rest of the body. The literature states that this period of discovery lasts approximately 40 years in ancient Greece. Actually, in Alexandria, Egypt, the Greeks would not allow dissection of humans in Greece proper and the period of dissection was not repeated until 1600 years later, at the beginning of the European period of scientific discovery. Let's now return to the mediastinum and begin our focus on the heart. First, realize that the heart does not sit exposed within the mediastinum. In fact, the heart is surrounded by a strong layer of membranes known as the pericardium, that encases the heart in a sac, the pericardial sac. To actually see and operate on the heart, a physician must by necessity cut open the sac as is now shown on the right hand image. The heart can now be seen and is labeled. The pericardium is reflected away from the heart. However, the pericardial sac is not simply a membrane, and it does play a role in specific clinical scenarios. So let's go into it a bit more detail about it, as shown in this drawing. The outer layer of the pericardial sac is known as the fibrous pericardium, and it is fused to the tunica adventitia of the great vessels, offering some protection to these vessels as they exit the heart. The fibrous pericardium is bound to the central tendon of the diaphragm. Perhaps you have had a chest x-ray in the past and remember being told to hold your breath just before the image is formed. The reason for this is that if you breathe and the diaphragm moves, the pericardium moves with it and the heart image will not appear as sharp as if you are holding your breath. The pericardium is also attached to the posterior surface of the sternum. Finally, the overall function of the pericardium is set to protect the heart against sudden overfilling. However, this is only speculation. Reports are present of congenital absence of the pericardium and after bypass surgery, the pericardium is left open. Moving now to the inside layer of the pericardium, we see that it consists of a serous pericardium. That is, 
These layers of the pericardium exhibit the ability to secrete small amounts of fluid between the layers that allows them to glide past one another, decreasing friction between the pericardial layers when the heart beats. As with the lung pleura, the layer that is closer to the body wall is known as the parietal layer, and the layer that surrounds the organ itself is known as the visceral layer. Also, as with the lung, realize that the visceral layer is microscopic. It cannot be seen with the naked eye. However, if you look at the heart after cutting open the fibrous pericardium, the visceral layer will be there and you're actually seeing the heart through the visceral layer. The final point to make about the serous pericardium is that between the parietal and visceral layers, a potential space exists. In the drawing, the space is evident, but in reality, the drawing highly exaggerates the potential space. This was done so that the potential space could be demonstrated. In the living, as already mentioned, the two layers simply glide past one another and there's no actual space. But if there's no true space, why even discuss it? In this drawing by Netter, various reasons are presented. The pericardium can become and does become inflamed, a condition known as pericarditis. The inflammation of the pericardium will be found within the pericardial space which then can become a true space and can significantly impair heart function. Possible causes for the inflammation include viruses and bacteria. Indeed, prior to significant oral surgery, dentists will provide patients with prophylactic antibiotics to prevent the onset of pericarditis. The oral cavity is not sterile, and when we study head and neck anatomy, we'll see that there's an uninterrupted path from just posterior to the mouth to the pericardium, the prevertebral space. If bacteria is introduced into the prevertebral space from the oral surgery, it can lead to the onset of pericarditis. The most alarming example of having fluid in the potential space of the pericardium is known as cardiac tamponade. Any fluid that enters a potential space and accumulates there will lead to the condition known as cardiac tamponade. If the fluid happens to be blood, the condition becomes known as hemopericardium. As to the reason the term tamponade is used, the word is derived directly from the French. Tamponé means to plug up. Causes for cardiac tamponade include a ruptured aortic aneurysm, a ruptured myocardial infarct, or a penetrating injury such as a knife wound. I wish to emphasize that cardiac tamponade is not a trivial condition. A patient must be treated immediately or death will ensue. As shown in the netter drawing, the patient will present in variable degrees of shock or in extremis, the classical term for shock. The patient will likely exhibit a decreased arterial pressure and a pulse pressure, but these are not truly pathognomonic signs for tamponade. Neck veins are distended because they are having a difficult time emptying into the heart. After all, the tamponade is squeezing the heart and the heart chambers are having a difficult time emptying to allow blood circulation to occur. Heart sounds, if present, are distant. The fluid in the pericardial cavity is dampening the sounds that can be heard. Finally, if venous pressure is taken, it is quite elevated. This is considered the pathognomonic sign of cardiac tamponade. I just mentioned that patients suffering cardiac tamponade need to be treated immediately. The question now becomes how to do this without causing any additional damage. 
And for this, we turn to the anatomy we know. We use pericardiosynthesis, a procedure that removes the fluid that has built up in the pericardial cavity. The procedure is done using a needle and a small catheter to drain the excess fluid. This is the clear part of the procedure. Too much fluid causing a problem, remove the excess fluid. The real concern is where to introduce the needle so as not to damage vital structures found in the area. On the left panel, we have a drawing of the thoracic cage. The sternal lines of pleural reflections are now labeled to highlight the mediastinal extent of the reflections. Now, the bare area of the pericardium is indicated both in the drawing and in the dissection to the right. This is the area that can be approached with a needle and catheter to avoid damaging the pleura and inducing a pneumothorax in a patient suffering from cardiac tamponade. This would not be considered good medical practice in an emergency room, regardless of the emergency of the procedure. Consequently, the needle is inserted below the fifth intercostal space into the bare area of the pericardium. An approach going below the coastal margin could also be used, but then the diaphragm would be pierced as well. Nowadays, echo guided procedures are used to guide the needle and avoid causing a pneumothorax. As to where the fluid of cardiac tamponade accumulates, let me remind you using three dissection images. On the left, I show the heart still encased by its fibrous pericardium. Cutting the fibrous pericardium, it can be reflected. Removing the heart reveals a potential space that surrounds it. This is known as the oblique sinus and can be an extensive reservoir for the cardiac tamponade. The oblique sinus is one of the two sinuses that are typically described as being associated with the heart. The other is the transverse cardiac sinus. This transverse sinus is located by inserting your index finger in between the superior vena cava and the ascending aorta. The transverse sinus location is easily distinguished from the oblique sinus by placing a hand posterior to the heart into a space, the oblique sinus. Again, the oblique sinus is best observed when the heart is removed and then the extent of the sinus can be appreciated. The question then that enters many students' mind is why does cardiac tamponade does not simply drain out of the oblique sinus into the much larger thoracic cavity via the transverse sinus? The answer lies in how the heart develops, turning from a tube into the four-chambered structure that it becomes. This is a topic that is discussed in embryology and will not be presented here. However, the two sinuses are not connected. Look at the drawing in which the heart was removed and the cut edge of the pericardium is demonstrated. The separation of the transverse from the oblique sinus can be observed. However, the transverse pericardial sinus is of clinical relevance in itself. It is exploited during coronary bypass surgery a surgical clamp is introduced into the space and blood flow of the aorta and pulmonary trunks stopped momentarily before the great vessels are connected to the bypass machine. This now concludes the mediastinum video, the first part of a three-part series on the heart.